There are so many wonderful conversations going on, I hate to break them up by starting our program. But I think we should start because it is a wonderful program. And um, uh, I, I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the Evo Institute, and it's, it's such an enormous, enormous privilege to, uh, to welcome Bella Meyer uh, here uh, to, uh, to our stage, to welcome all of you this evening for what I think is going to be a wonderful talk about what it means to be the granddaughter of Marc Chagall, his legacy. Well, in a way, the Evo Institute has a sort of filial relationship to Marc Chagall as well. In that magical time between the wars, when Evo uh, came into being. It attracted some of the greatest intellects and creative talents throughout all of Europe. Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud were on the, uh, on, on the, on the board of the Evo trustees. And one of those magical people that Evo attracted was Marc Chagall. He was so eager to see the Evo Institute develop an art museum, an art department. And he donated generously his work to Evo, all of which disappeared during the war. He was an inspiration to this institution. He loved this institution. We have discovered now in Vilnius, as we continue to pour through the unprocessed materials of what we call the Vilna collections in our, in our vast project to digitize and to uh, process all of these materials that were part of the Evo uh, archive and library before the war. We have found new letters between Chagall and, and Max Weinreich, who was director of Evo at the time. Chagall's influence remains with us. It is uh, a part of our legacy and not just a part of our legacy. It is a continuing inspiration. We have a small exhibit and only a partial exhibit of the materials of Marc Chagall that we have in our archive. We have uh, uh, photographs, we have letters, we have his, uh, his memoir in, in Yiddish. Uh, we have many, many things that link us to this wonderful, wonderful man, this great creative genius which was part of the creative genius of the Evo Institute when it was founded. Bella was born in Paris and raised in Switzerland. She was immersed in the world of art, obviously. She always painted while studying art history and obtaining her PhD in medieval art history from the Sorbonne. Bella taught art history, wrote numerous academic papers, delivered informative first-hand experiences in lecture form of her grandfather, Marc Chagall's work, invited uh, to take on responsibility for the visual arts as the cultural services of the French Embassy, Bella settled in New York, where she has held this position for a number of years. Adding to her expanding list of accomplishments, she has had her hand in costume design, mask making for a number of theater performances and also created many puppets for her own puppet show productions. Bella's passion for beauty and aesthetics led her to become a floral designer. Those of you who have not gone to her wonderful, uh, I want to call it a studio, it's, it's actually uh, a, a shop, a florist, uh, a, a beautiful florist shop, you should do so. I think it's on 12th Avenue, no? 11th Street? 11th Street. 11th Street. Not far from here. Um, uh, she describes her love for flowers to discover its essence, opening life, death, is to experience an unimaginable mystery. Bella founded Fleur Bella, a floral design and decor company in 2005, focusing her talents 
on creating floral arrangements much in the way an artist paints. So I want to welcome Bella to the stage. Thank you. Well, hello. Does it work? Oh, this is magical. Um, so thank you, thank you all at YIVO. Thank you who are here for giving me this immense uh, pleasure to be here. And it is in fact a real honor uh, to stand in front of you at YIVO this most ominous institution which Chagall admired so very much. And to dwell on his fervent belief in saving Jewish culture. And also to be allowed to share with you some memories with my grandfather whom I adored. Who in my childhood, uh, in my childhood was the center of attention for my whole family. So what can I say? And how can I show you that indeed the very rich Yiddish culture which he grew up in became a most relevant part of his artistic psyche and vocabulary, which in turn made me, when I was little, dream about this unknown world while sitting next to him and completely oblivious to any conversations, I would get lost in this very painting hanging in their dining room. Can I share with you how passionate an artist he was, in need to paint at every breath? He was funny, like to joke and make fun of himself. But in fact, he always felt safest when painting and working. When I was little, grandfather lived in the south of France. First in Vence and then in Saint-Paul-de-Vence. We'd go and visit him and we'd go straight to his large studio where he'd be busy painting. He was a very small man, delicate. He seemed to nearly disappear behind a landscape of brushes, yet his presence was incredibly luminous. And when we entered the studio, his face would light up and he smiled at us with such intensity, awe and love you thought that the whole space was being flooded by brilliant light. I loved when he would take my hand, play with my fingers, and dig his nails into my fingertips. It felt as if he was sculpting, or as if he needed more tactile contact to experience us more fully. But soon, he had to return to his canvas and paint. It was wonderful to watch him pick out few long brushes, then choose one to scoop up some paint and add numerous small essential dots here and there. His gestures were very delicate, quick and precise, similar to a dance. He would call it picote, to peck. Grandfather was a very shy man and shy about his paintings, maybe coy. In fact, he'd ask us quite sheepishly if we liked his paintings, if we liked Chagall. And so, of course, we answered, oui, grandpapa. Genuinely relieved, he'd usually turn back to his canvas, scrutinize it, and then say, ah, il faut un peu plus de Chagall, now, it just needs a little more Chagall. 
And so appeared more dancing and flying figures and branches, lines and dots, followed by sudden forceful etchings into the still wet oil paint, as if he had to conquer the material he was working with. Sometimes, while painting, grandfather would talk to us about his childhood in Vitebsk, growing up in a simple, poor, but very warm Jewish Orthodox household, about his large family, and about his loving, doting, but strict mother, very savvy and smart, yet illiterate, about his hard-working father, who only found serenity while praying, about his seven sisters, all younger, here Lisa, his favorite, and his dear brother David, who died of pneumonia when barely 20 years old. Grandfather's depiction of his Vitebsk, his Russia, sounded more like chance. Fueled with nostalgia for the warm, simple, yet rich Jewish life, written by songs and prayers, feasts and rit rituals. Oh, but it was most wondrous when he would conjure up the image of Bella, his love. His muse, his wife, our grandmother, whom we have actually never known as she died very prematurely during their exile here in America in 1944. Whenever he would paint her early on or here in the 1920s, she'd always appear with her deep and far-reaching gaze as if to open his horizons. He would tell us how her love and her respect for his artistic quest became the guiding force for all of his creation. Indeed, Bella understood him and stood by him, supported him, quite literally carried him and pushed him to search further. It is in this context that grandfather would ask us, without fail, if we had found our ideal. You must imagine this to be quite ominous, a question asked to a naive child, as I certainly was. He wanted us to find the ideal, just as he told us that Bella had found it. What did he mean by this word? Was he talking about a moral value? a spiritual principle, about truth, perhaps? Oopsie. Something is not working here. Hmm. Help. <laughs> Help. No. Uh-oh. Something, yes, here. <laughs> Or instead, was he referring to one's inner self and path? About uncompromising cultural and creative quests? Was he talking about love? When I was little, I always linked this word, the ideal, with his drive to work. The need of painting enchanted paintings, such as this. Indeed. Each time we'd visit him with my mother, he would show her, one by one, all the paintings he had accomplished ever since our previous visit, Anxious, anxiously waiting for her approval. In fact, she had, after her mother's death, become the person whom he trusted most. They would talk in Russian. That was their way of communicating. With us grandchildren, he spoke in French, with this endearing Yiddish-Russian guttural accent. Later, when I was in, a student in Paris, I'd often take the train and go visit grandfather and Vava, and so we talked, or in fact, he talked, about paint as a tool, as a medium, transgressed by mystery, by chemistry, la chimie, as he liked to say. 
he would lead my gaze to the very texture of the paint in front of us. He pointed to what he was trying to find while painting and longingly reminisced about that time some 50 years earlier when he painted this extraordinary panel, Love on the Stage, in 1920 for the Yiddish theater. It is in this context that grandfather would ask, uh, no, sorry, oopsie. <laughs> he felt that back then, while painting this panel, he had succeeded to give real meaning to the colors, such as white and black, even gray, something he confessed to me he had been trying to achieve again ever since. He would talk about colors and the singing of the pigment, but never about the subject he was depicting. He did not explain any of his compositions because these were his gift and his way to share silently or with an outcry his feelings and understanding of the world around him. Nor would he share with us how he survived all the numerous social and political upheavals in his youth or in the 30s and 40s as a Jew, as an artist, as a Jewish artist in Russia and in France. Chagall was born into an observant, very provincial Hasidic family in Vit Vitebsk. But more importantly, into a time of great interest and celebration of Jewish folklore and an effer effervescent renaissance of a specifically secular Jewish cultural consciousness. He grew up speaking Yiddish, and he spent all his childhood at a traditional cheder learning just a little bit of Hebrew, reading and hearing the Bible stories. He sang at the synagogue until his bar mitzvah. But then, thanks to his mother's openness to an already widespread Jewish secular trend, as well as her astuteness, the young Chagall entered a municipal Russian school, usually close to Jews and soon also followed classes at Yehuda Penn's local art school. Thus, the world opened for Chagall. He observed his surroundings and started writing poems in Russian. He befriended groups of more educated, well-off and secular Russian-speaking Jewish youth who introduced him to the world of Russian poetry and music. He left for St. Petersburg a forbidden city for Jews, unless you had a special permit. He attended two prominent art schools where he grew into the worldliness of Western art, but also rediscovered the richness of the folklore of his own Jewish and Russian ancestry. His friend Al Lisitsky was eager to catalog all Jewish folk sources, and together with Chagall, Altman, and other artists, attempted to create a new contemporary Jewish art. Chagall became friendly with poets such as the Russian symbolist Alexander Bloch, who insisted in the importance of blending art and life, art and nature. This gave him the, let's say, artistic permission to dwell on what he so longed for, the characters and landscape of Vitebsk, which had shaped his being. The sun calls me to the virgin scenery to draw, as he writes in a letter. And as he recollected few years later in my life, while describing how hungry he was, and added to all that a yearning to paint Somewhere down there, waiting for me, are green rabbis, peasants in their baths, red Jews, kind, intelligent, their staffs, their sex on the streets, in houses, and even on roofs. They wait for me, I wait for them, we wait for each other. But in fact, it was only after an enriching four-year stay in Paris 
where he had been invigorated by its light, by the energy and colors which he so needed to grow as an artist. Structured by encounters with influential writers and poets, thinkers and artists, and yes, Jewish magazine publishers too, dealers and collectors. When he had come back to visit his Vitebsk, his family, and to claim Bella as his wife, that he embraced his Jewishness anew. World War I broke out, and Chagall got stuck. He had indeed hoped to stay in his hometown only a short while, and then return to Paris. Instead, he had to stay and witness and witness the major migrations of displaced Jews flooding Vitebsk. A fervent need for Jewish identity, identity became widespread. Thousands of Jewish refugees were lodged in the numerous synagogues of the town, as well as in many a private Jewish homes. All Yiddish and Hebrew magazines and publications were banned. News were horrific. Hunger was widespread, and Russians blamed Jews, especially Yiddish-speaking Jews, to have collaborated with Germans. Professor Harshov presents us with a beautiful thought, reflecting on the biblical passage about banishment, the Parsha Lek Leko, here compared to the Russian Jews, yet again expulsed, uh, expulsed from their own paternal land and homes. He reminds us that Sholem Alechem named the last chapter of his story about David the milkman also Lek Leko, referring to the expulsion of Jews from all Russian villages just a few, a few years prior. Here, on the halo, the yellow halo crowning the old bearded Jew, can we really, as he says, decipher parts of the story in printed Hebrew letters? Thus, Chagall adopted the image of the eternal Jew, depicted even more explicitly in this moving drawing of a full bearded Jew with his hat taking with him, with his hat, taking with him on his back his family home, like a pecule. Chagall asked beggars to sit for him, but he also embarked in documenting everything around him, from his family to his neighborhood, soldiers and musicians. In 1915, my grandparents finally married and succeeded at least for a while to escape to the countryside, actually not far from where lived Rabbi Schneerson. Later in Petrograd, while having to serve as a clerk in a military office, Chagall participated in numerous avant-garde exhibitions. He also joined the newly founded Jewish Society for the Encouragement of Fine Arts with his patron and friend Ma Max Winnerwehr as the president and became very active a participant trying to spearhead better education for Jewish children. He was invited to illustrate the children's stories by their nister and later, the magician by the classic writer Peretz. Then came the October Revolution. It was an extraordinary moment for all Russian Jews, who suddenly became free to be and exist. Much emphasis was put into ideology and culture. A huge surge of artistic and creative experimentation took place. My grandparents embraced this newfound freedom of expression and Chagall became a fervent partisan of the artistic and intellectual ideas exploding at the beginning of this exciting period. He was appointed to the position of plenipotentiary on matters of art in Vitebsk province 
And so, with his little family in tow, he moved back to Vitebsk to create the first free art academy to which he attracted the most diverse artists, from his first academic teacher, Penn, to the most prominent theoreticians such as Lisitsky and Malevich. The school remained for a while the most important active revolutionary art school with 600 students. For the first anniversary of the revolution, Chagall decided to employ everybody in Vitebsk to paint huge street banners like propaganda posters. He, created, he also created an art museum in Vitebsk and participated in numerous art debates and fought for the importance of art education for the proletariat, as he says. He promoted the idea of leftist art, but in fact not as a tool, nor as an enhancer of the political revolution but instead as a revolution in itself within the history of art. Chagall fought for a new art and a new way of expression, and as such saw himself very much part of a Jewish collective, a Jewish proletariat. Chagall was a most committed teacher, but his students eventually shifted to the even more radical ideas of suprematism and non-objective art. After one too many, of too many clashes between the two artists, Chagall and Malevich, Chagall, very disillusioned, left his hometown for Moscow. But Chagall, with his mischievous wit, actually made a kind of a parody of that difficult period, which you can see here, with the art school in the background, behind abstract shapes, with his signature appearing multiple times and in different languages. And best of all, a little figure holding a big green umbrella, probably himself, parading in front of the art school. When the threesome arrived in Moscow, Chagall was offered to paint the scenery for the first theater performance of the experimental Yiddish chamber theater who had just moved their quarters to Moscow. Not only did he build the stage for the three pieces by Sholem Alechem, but he also decided to paint all the walls of the theater thus creating an extraordinary manifesto for the freedom of expression and for the rebirth of Jewish culture. The big white and gray panel we have seen a while ago is part of this ensemble, which was soon called the Chagall box. Here is the introduction to the Yiddish theater. So when grandfather, back at his studio in Saint-Paul-de-Vence, reminisced with me about these paintings, he talked about the colors and the textures. But it is undeniable that within its context, each detail, each shape is a narrative to the whole. And it represented indeed the culmination of what the Yiddish collective stood for. And that pivotal time, at that pivotal time, during the short period of freedom of expression at the start of the Bolshevik Revolution. Many Yiddish idioms are part of this complex composition. Many personal hints are touched. Many most provocative solutions to overturn stag stagnant traditions are proposed. It is indeed a formidable manifesto for Yiddish culture, wit, and art, which maybe was appreciated at that time, but according to Chagall, was definitely understood by one person, the great actor Michoels. As we know, 
the initial great hopes and vision for a truly proletarian egalitarian system in Russia soon failed and eventually were transformed into a doctrinarian, idealistic Soviet regime. It was very hard for grandfather to leave Russia again, this time for good, very disillusioned by the changes, tired for fighting for all what he believed in. Later, in his personal notes, jotted down in Russian, he noted, in Kovno, it seemed strange to me that there, not far at all, just behind the city walls, was Russia. And that in Russia, there was the revolution which, maybe, I had not understood, or understood in my own way. But I had to continue my journey. I had to return to Paris. And in another note I found, I decided to leave. I was as tired as a twig. I wanted to go where I could just drown as much as I wanted in the melancholy of colors. I just wanted to reach a place where I could paint paintings out of this world, not academic and not formal, paintings which would bring me peace and which would become like tears hanging in the air. Once Bella and little Ida had joined him in Kovno, they traveled to Berlin, where with the guidance of Hermann Struck, he learned the art of engraving, a starting point for many works and book creations during his whole life. In 1923, the family finally arrived in Paris. And after settling in a studio, he immediately started painting drawing from his past pictorial vocabulary, creating replicas from paintings he had lost, and starting new compositions. Chagall felt that at this point, he needed to find himself through nature and the brilliant yet soft light of France. I want an art of the earth, not of the head, he said opulent flower bouquets, which Bella brought him, made their way into his paintings, like free-formed celebrations of the French countryside, and reflected a new state of well-being. In Paris, they enjoyed an active social life, and Chagall was all intent to receive his French citizenship, which the government only granted him ten years later. Together with Bella, they remained in close touch with all the Yiddish activists, poets, as well as the Yiddish theater. In 1925, he writes for Peretz's 10th anniversary of his death. Walking in the streets, at that very corner, behind a fence, a Jewish, oh, he quotes him, Walking in the streets, at that very corner, behind a fence, a Jewish moon with a dark horizon behind it suddenly leaps at your feet from the sky. Reading this, I wonder, was my grandfather talking about Peretz's world or his own? He worked with the art book publisher Ambroise Vollard on a number of projects, engraving fantastical illustrations for the dead soul by Gogol, the Fable de la Fontaine, and some preliminary gouaches for a cycle on the circus. But nothing gave my grandfather more joy than to return to his childhood world and be able to start the formidable task to illustrate the Bible. In 1931, the first mayor of Tel Aviv, Mayor Dizngoff, invited Chagall to visit Palestine and consult on the creation of an art museum. So, as a family, they spent nearly three months visiting kibbutzim, villages and cities, and all the biblical sites, meeting old friends, artists, poets, politicians, and visionaries. 
as he stated later, he went there as a Jew, and as a Jew was happy to feel safe, and to feel such enthusiasm for the future, also struggle for the new. He looked, watched, and painted. He felt a deep attachment to the prophets, to the biblical stones, and fought for the art museum to become a real museum with a plan for collecting Jewish artistic values, as he said. But he was, regrettably, not heard. Instead, back in France, he plunged into the illustrations of the Bible, a project which actually took him many years. Meanwhile, as you know, YIVO had been created in Vilna. And as we can attest from the letter written for the first conference in Vilna in 1929 and which is exhibited outside, Chagall wholeheartedly believed that this secular and scientific institution could only be of value with the inclusion of a section for the arts. He hoped for a museum. The Renaissance for Jewish culture remained primarily verbal but Chagall demanded that Yivo set up courses to study the problem of art, as he says, and Jewish art in particular. The vision of a museum for Jewish art became all the more urgent as Hitler came to power, and three of Chagall's paintings were burnt. Indeed, the Yivo Museum was opened in 1935 by Professor Simon Dubnov with a small show of Chagall's etchings alongside an exhibition of other Jewish artists. My grandparents traveled to Vilna on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the Institute and Chagall gave his seminal speech ending with these beautiful words. For a long time, I have wanted to say these few words about our role, the role of all of us, not just artists, but scientists, and all Jews for the good of all humanity. In these days of crisis, when world crises, wars, revolutions flare up over a piece of bread, and the Jews truly don't have the wherewithal or the where to live, there is still no sweeter mission than suffering and working for our goal, for our spirit, which lives in our Bible, which lives in our dreams about art, which can help bring the Jews to the true and right path to achieve which other nations just spill blood, their own and others. After the visit to Vilna and subsequently to ghettos, my grandmother Bella, deeply moved by the anti-Semitism, feared that their culture, their Yiddish world, was about to be wiped out. It is at this point that she started writing her beautiful and poetic account in Yiddish about her childhood, written and shaped by all the Ye uh, Jewish holidays. Oopsie. No. Here. <laughs> Which, as assimilated and secular Jew she had become, she had shared very little of with her da own daughter, Ida, my mother. Myself. I only got the first inkling of Yiddish culture when my mother offered me the book, Brennan de Licht, which during my late childhood I read, not in Yiddish, and reread endlessly, trying to understand something of what I had not known. And so when I looked at my grandfather's paintings at home, such as this one, The Gates of the Cemetery, I felt like her words and imagery dancing out of the paintings. Grandfather never talked to us grandchildren about these times in Europe and then in America, 
which had well America which had welcomed them in 1941, rescued by the ingenious Varian Fry of the Emergency Rescue Committee. Yet there too he continued to work relentlessly because this was his only way to fight. Many wonderful and challenging projects were offered to him. He never told us about when he lost his beloved Bella in 1944 in New York just when they had hoped for a return to liberated France. Instead, he wanted us to see the beauty in the world, in us, the enchantment in art. In fact, he called art his religion. When I paint, I pray, Chagall would say. Grandfather wanted color, sounds, words, and thoughts to assume a palpable meaning, not connected to history, but rather to one's heart and spirit. He lived a very long time, and he painted to the very last day of his life. He fought for art to be seen by all. He wanted his paintings to be seen. So nothing made him happier than when the French government offered him to open a museum in Nice, assembling a large group of his paintings called the Biblical Message. That is where he hoped, as he voiced at the opening, that the young and not so young would come in search of an ideal of brotherhood and love, such as my colors and my lines have dream, uh, dreamt it. Grandfather, late in his life, finding solace in the Bible and, it, in, and in its spirit, came to believe very much that the perfection of art and in life stems from the biblical source. And that, is, and that it was essential to find each of our colors of love and hope. Whether it was painting an intimate portrait of his family, or demonstrating his beliefs in freedom, or depicting Christ as a Jew, or celebrating life, Chagall relentlessly, uncompromisingly, unfashionably, always searched for the true essence of the color. This was his way, his only way to fight in life, the only way to fight for harmony and peace, his way to come closer to the ideal and truth. This ideal which he so much hoped for us grandchildren to find. And so it was only during his very last years of his life that I started to understand what grandf uh, grandfather meant by his relentless questioning, did you find your ideal? Do you love me? Do you love my paintings? Have you found love? Because, as Chagall once said, for those who love, everything is clear. For those who don't, what can we do? Thank you. I hope you have many questions, if, that's, if that is all right. Oh, thank you, Bella. Uh, my question, uh, your grandfather visited the Soviet Union, I believe it was in the 60s. And, uh, can 73. You Excuse me? 1973. Oh, I'm sorry, 1973. Um, uh, did he have a relationship with a Russian Soviet artists, uh, uh, perhaps not uh, painters, but musicians or 
for others. Uh, if you know uh, any, did he have any friendship with the Soviet artists, uh, Jewish, non-Jewish, anything about that? He never talked to me about it, and I never saw any letters to any Soviet artists, but there's someone in this room who would know much more and could probably answer the question. <laughs> Alessandra? <laughs> Oh, he met, but not in Moscow. This artist came to him south of uh, south of France, and uh, it was our well-known artist. It was Salahov. It was Anatoly Nikic, and Nikic told me about this. And uh, <laughs> so funny. Chagall asked him. He was very polite, very kind, and he put his hand on the hand of Nikic, and he told him, you understand that the real painter should live in only in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> because, because he told the sky in Paris, they are wet and color is so, so vivid. And <laughs> Nikic, who was big, big Soviet official artist for him, it was, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. He tried you. to see his relatives, he tried to see yeah. his friends, you know, from Toronto. Yeah. And he, he was only for two weeks. And for him it was very important to meet for the first time after many, many years his famous uh, Jewish frescoes. Yeah. That's why it was. Where are the frescoes? Somebody <laughs> Don't ask me, I have a long, long story. It was in the Tretikov Gallery. And it was very, very interesting that he did not sign them when he painted them in 1920. And uh, people from Tretikov Gallery asked him to sign. And he signed, it's very, very, uh, very, very rare signature in Russian. He wrote, you know, this. And it was 1973, can you imagine? that only during his two weeks, his paintings were on display in Tretyakov Gallery. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, studying at the university, in Moscow University, and they disappeared just next day after his uh, departure. Yeah, thank you. This, the, the paintings Alessandra is talking about uh, um, are the ones which I showed you the introduction to the Yiddish theater, which is actually huge. Um, and the white panel called Love and Stage, and there are several other components, components to it which I thought we might not have time to see. Uh, they, he actually indeed had thought that they were lost and was so happy to hear shortly before his visit that they had been saved by some wonderful people. And so that was a great moment for him. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if, this is a personal question for you, if, if there's a painting by Chagall that you most love, and if so, what is it in the painting that um, touches you? Um, yes, every day I have a new favorite painting. <laughs> That's the first thing. <laughs> and then I think what touches me most is when I can feel and see the paint vibrate. It's not necessary, necessarily what he tells. Um, or what you see, but it's really the the um, paint, the texture with which which um, enchants me. So. Would 
Would you like a mic? Thank you. Bella, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, here in New York, uh, and I in particular, love to visit Lincoln Center and see the magnificent murals there. And I wondered, you must have been a very young girl, very little girl when they were created. Were they created by your grandfather uh, at Lincoln Center, I guess while it was being constructed or uh, in his studio? And you know, uh, were they one of his um, favorite creations also? For, uh, thank you, Margaret. I'm, I'm not my I'm not younger than you, so I wasn't a little girl when he painted them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, um, um, no, he did, when he was commissioned um, uh, to do these paintings, there were lots of discussions of what he should do for the new building. And he painted them on a very big, uh, canvases. I don't remember how many parts of uh, like huge strips of canvases there are which he painted on and um, the city in Paris um, um, lent him a studio actually the Gobelin where they do tapestries to paint these uh, paintings where he also had done a number of other big monumental paintings. And he, um, um, so that's where he painted them. He had an assistant and, um, but, and then they were, the, they were brought, they were brought here, there were uh, several, there was, he chose the, he chose the theme, the triumph of music the origin of music, the triumph of music, he, he's the one who chose it, and but discussed it with the team at the Metropolitan uh, Opera and Lincoln Center. And then he, um, he did it and they were shipped. And his assistant who, um, I, I apologize, I forget his name, helped the, the production team at Lincoln Center to mount them on the walls. When he arrived, they were all done, uh, put on, but, but they had put them on the wrong side of each other. <laughs> so, um, but then he realized that actually that wasn't, was maybe a very good accident. So yes, so that's how it was. <laughs> I just wonder, um, with the rise of um, the Nazis and anti-Semitism, how did this interface with your grandfather? Was there any reflection in his art? Did it influence, at the time, his work? Well, yes, it influenced him greatly in his work. Um, the one painting I showed you, Solitude, uh, with the Jew hovering over the Torah with the white cow behind a symbol of Jerusalem, of the Bible, um, is a very solemn uh, reaction of the beginning um, of the times. The, um, I forget the angel, the this big painting of the red angel falling is a painting he worked on for many years during all this time. And it became more and more dramatic as times went on. He did not know how to, how, what to do. He, he would write that sometimes he wished he could just go and be a soldier, but he knew he couldn't do that. He was a little man. He, he would never know what to do. The only way he could try to fight was 
by painting. So he, he was very much um, influenced by it, lived with it um, all the time, wrote poems, many poems, which helped him trying to at least ask questions. Uh, but then I just found in these notes, which he wrote later, that when they were on the boat which led them to exile to America, he looked at the sea for many days and wondered how the world could not just be as harmonious as the sea is, and also very much wanted to forget. He wanted to forget, he just wanted to forget. But obviously he couldn't. You're welcome. Uh, Bella, um, you know how much I loved my trip to the Biblical Message Museum. And when I was there, I spent a lot of time on the drawer that had the sketches of um, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think that he had a special affinity or love for Jacob of all the biblical characters, or was that my imposition on his work? Well, I think, I mean, it, uh, it is clearly your perception. Actually, I feel very much the same way, um, but I don't know. I really don't know what, what he felt. Um, I remember myself looking at numerous of his paintings, squashes, drawings, and paintings of that same um, moment, um, which he chose among many other possibilities of the text. He chose this particular moment to illustrate. Also, um, uh, because you're right, because he was re-questioning re himself all the time. Um, I'm sure it was very important. <coughs> if it was his favorite uh, biblical, if Jacob was his favorite, um, how do you say, character <laughs> in the Bible? I don't know. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, do you know if he was connected to some of the other Jewish artists in Paris at the time, like Soutine, who were eventually killed? Um, do you know if he had much connection with them? I didn't, uh, did you ask if he had much connections with Jewish artists? Like Soutine. Like Soutine. Yes, he knew them very, uh, very much so. He knew all of them also that when he was in Paris the first time as a young student, let's say, he met them all in La Ruche um, and then uh, and uh, continued to uh, see them. They didn't have much um, communication together other than seeing each other in galleries or exhibitions. They never worked together. They, um, he, he wasn't, um, he preferred to spend time with poets or musicians rather than artists. Hi. I'm very curious of the moment. I'm just using it metaphorically. It's many moments. When you realize who your grandfather was, must have been, could you talk about it? That, you know, not everybody's grandfather was a huge painter like this. And you had friends who didn't go home to Chagall, who was their grandpa. So that realization must have, I, I, I don't want to imagine that. If you could tell us about it, it would be great. 
What realization are you talking about? Well, you were a young girl. You had friends. I always knew that he was a painter. I know, but, but then what it meant. Yes. Well, still, that also meant that he was a painter and that, for me, he was, ex he was very important. I adored him and admired him. He could not say, he couldn't say anything wrong. I mean, I admired him. And, um, and at home, we always talked about him, or it was always talked about him. Around in, the ho uh, in our house, all his paintings were there. Okay, they were fabulous. They were like my friends. I spent lots of time looking at his paintings. But why was there so much uh, um, I'm looking for a Yiddish word. Um, um, all these things happening at home when there was an opening, or why were there all these people coming to the openings? Why did we have, uh, would we, my twin sister and I, yet have to have a new dress made just for this purpose? Uh, and. Uh, there were all these official people coming, and everybody came to him and called him maître, and uh, but which was also very common because when he worked with um, um, the specialists for artists for the lithographs or engravings or for the glass windows, they all called him maître, and so. I thought it was a little silly, but but they had huge respect for him, and we're in France after all. Uh, but it did take me, maybe because I was really naive, probably still am, uh, quite a long time to wonder if he was only known at home, or in the immediate surroundings, or it was all set up that you went to the Paris Opera and there was some big ceiling of his and all these people, you know, um, uh, standing guards for him and for the minister. Um, <laughs> after all, I, I did have to ask a very silly question one day to to someone I played with on the weekends asking what her grandfather was doing and she thought it was a very silly question and then she answered, I don't remember, and then she was very polite and asked me, well, what is mine doing? And so I said, he's a painter. And I guess she, she then said, well, who is it? I, she was probably much more savvy than I was. So I told her she did not react. So that was the proof to me that, well, they are really playing it very high at home. And um, <laughs> except that next, the, ne the following week, she comes to me running, touches my arm, and says, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, Chagall is your grandfather? So that's how I learned it. <laughs> Hi. I was just going to ask if your grandfather, he himself, had a personal favorite of all of his work, and also how he felt about the windows at Hadassah in Jerusalem. Well, I think his favorite paintings were really the introduction to the Yiddish theater. He thought that, and, and maybe because he was so strong and, and he felt that with these panels he could express um, all, all what he wanted to express. And it's all there. And um, it would take hours to look at all of them and to see how, how rich they are, not only in their textures and colors, but also in all 
the wit and the, the phrases, the, the world he put in there. Um, he loved the Hadassah windows. It was a tremendous honor for him to do that and was felt very moved to give them to Israel. He loved Israel, even though he's not, he wasn't a Zionist, but he still, sentimentally, he really loved Israel and was very happy to give it to them um, and worked with a wonderful uh, stained glass master for that. Ultimately, then, became very upset because of course, the Hadassah Hospital had to grow, and so the buildings grew, and there was less and less light for the glass windows, and he became very upset and um, didn't say very nice things about, about Israel, let's say. <laughs> Well, this is more windows. I recall seeing some of his windows. I don't know if it was a church or other building in Mainz in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how he felt about working in Germany in one of the oldest cathedral cities and uh, what you remember about it. Thank you. The, the, um, um, the whole series of glass windows he did for the church in uh, Mainz is the last is the last group of windows he actually did, and he died before uh, they were finished. He had done all the all the maquettes, uh, final maquettes, and Charles Marc then just had to execute them. But it took him actually quite many years to accept to do these windows. Um, he had uh, created glass windows in other uh, churches. And from the very beginning, when he did the it, glass windows, he really had to question himself first. And it, he wondered. and. He wrote to the chief rabbi in Paris. He wrote to the chief rabbi in Israel. He wrote to Weizmann. He wrote to all of them, asking them what he should do. Ultimately, he said, and they all said, well, what you feel, whatever you feel. <laughs> but he had, uh, and he then, then, he can do it as an artist who loves he loves art. He's a Jew, but he's giving the gift of these beautiful things, uh, beautiful <laughs> works and light. But then Germany, it took him a lot of coaxing him to accept doing it. It was quite difficult. And uh, the, um, how do you call it, the pastor, uh, Klaus Meyer was very good in convincing him. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I didn't pick up one more question. One more question. Okay. And then running out. <laughs> hey, Bella. Um, thank you. It's been a lovely, lovely evening. Uh, bringing this back to you, uh, I, I have to say that one of the great ongoing art uh, happenings in New York is Fleur Bella. Uh, uh, where, where is it again? Where, what's the address of Fleur Bella? 55 East 11th Street. Okay. <laughs> but, but the question I wanted to ask you about it is, I mean, it really isn't a flower shop. You have to go see it. But anyway, the point, do you find yourself, this is a question about you, do you find yourself in talking to your assistants about the arrangements you're making and so forth, channeling the kinds of things that your grandfather used to say to you about paint and about color and about texture. Do you find the same kinds of things coming clear through? Well, <clears throat> it's sort of embarrassing, but when I wrote the talk um, and um, 
paraphrase what he said. I said, oh, do I really say this to my team? And uh, it's true, actually. I, um, uh, over the few years I had this place, I become, I'm becoming more and more um, um, uh, militant about colors and about combinations and textures and movement. And that's all what they hear. And I think some of them are here. And um, it must be quite boring for them, but that's what I believe in. <laughs> So maybe it is Chagall channeling through me. I don't know. <laughs>